We're going to pick up where we left off last Sunday. Um, if you did, if you weren't here last Sunday, you're going to want to go online and uh, watch the uh, uh, the video sermon, I guess, uh, and get part one because it kind of lays some of the foundational information with regards to Islam. We'll cover a little bit, kind of recover some of that today, uh, but we're going to kind of branch off and uh, uh, go uh, a little further with it. Honestly, I could probably speak on this for for several weeks and not exhaust what really needs to be said. There's there's so many different um, aspects of this, and, 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 and I am learning. You know, this is not my area of expertise by any means, so I'm learning along the way too. Uh, I'm trying to be as uh, honest uh, and true to um, what I'm finding, what you know, what research uh, I'm doing, and uh, uh, trying to convey that in as uh, authentic of a manner as I can. Uh, but then again, uh, you know, you you need to go behind me, and you need to do your own research and and look into to things. Um, one of the greatest movements of our time, and you need to be aware of this, one of the greatest movements of our time in terms of its global impact is the growth uh, of Islam around the world. It's been around for 14 years, but there is definitely a surge uh, in terms of Islam in the past uh, decade or two, but in particular the past several years. Today, Islam is, uh, is currently uh, the fastest growing religion on the planet. It, and there's no close second. Not even a close second. Uh, it is the second, world, second largest religion in the world. It claims to have 1.6 billion followers. That may be conservative. 1.6 billion followers. That's one out of every five people living on this planet would be identified as a Muslim, or about 23% of the world's population. In comparison, uh, all of Christianity, with all of its various denominations, has about somewhere between 1.8 and uh, 2.0 billion people on the planet. Uh, so they're not that far apart even now. Uh, a United Nations uh, demographic report forecasts that Muslims will represent, listen to this, go ahead to the next slide, Nicholas. Uh, Muslims will represent at least half of the global birth rate after the year 2055. So one, about, one out of every two people being born uh, in about 30 years from now is going to be Muslim. Um, and this is the slide that, uh, that kind of goes with what I'm going to share with you here. CBS News researched uh, Islam's growth and estimates that Islam will match the size of Christianity. It's almost there now, but will match the size of Christianity in terms of global population by the year 2050. Uh, that's without jihad. With jihad, it's growing at an exponential rate. In fact, uh, the Pew Research Center has concluded that Islam is growing at a faster rate than the current world population fertility rate. That Islam is growing faster than, uh, than, non, than non-Muslims uh, at an estimated growth rate. If you'll just look at the bar graph there, that Islam is growing at a rate of 75% growth over the course of the next 40 years when Christianity is only growing at a rate of about 35% growth over, uh, over the course of the next uh, 40 years. That's twice as fast. Twice as fast. In 2010, uh, there was an estimated... Go ahead to the next slide, Nicholas. In 2010, there were an estimated uh, 23.4% of the world population uh, was Islam, uh, Islamic. By the year 2020, they are estimating that it will be closer to 25%. It's growing by... The world population is increasing by about 1.5% uh, Muslim population uh, every year. Uh, or, I'm sorry, every 10 years. So it's growing exponentially. Although Islam was born in Arabia, today most Muslims are not uh, of Ar- uh, Arabic descent. Uh, it started there in Arabia, but that's not where the vast majority of, uh, of Muslims live. According to the Pew Research Center, which is a pretty reliable source, Indonesia 
uh, and you can see that on the map, Indonesia has 985 uh, million Muslims, or 87% of its population is Muslim. Pakistan has 137 million Muslims, 97% of its population is Muslim. The Middle East and North Africa have 316 million Muslims, or about 93% of its population is Muslim. Uh, and in particular, North Africa, it's almost 90, <coughs> including Egypt, is 99% Muslim. India, which we would associate with Hinduism, uh, actually has a very large Muslim population. 138 million uh, Muslims live in India, with 14% of the total population being Islamic. Uh, Islam is the second largest religion in Europe, with uh, uh, over 43 million. Uh, go ahead to the next slide. Uh, someone has written that if it had not been for an individual by the name of Charles Martel who defeated the Muslims at a uh, battle back in uh, the year 732, uh, the Battle of Tours in France, uh, that if it had not been for that particular battle, it's very possible that all of Europe uh, would have fallen to, to Islam. Uh, my sister-in-law just got back from Germany. She had been there for a month. She had uh, traveled uh, to other areas or other countries around that area. Uh, and she said, everywhere you went, uh, was, there was evidence of the Muslim population. Go ahead to the next slide. According to uh, Muslim leaders uh, from, their own, uh, from their own people, uh, they estimate that there's around 6 million Muslims in the United States. Uh, I've seen other estimates that's closer to 9 million Muslims in the United States. Um, and I, just to kind of put this in perspective, if, if it was 6 million, that would be about half the size of uh, the, the largest Christian denomination in the United States, which is Southern Baptist. And they are running around somewhere around 15 million. So if the Muslims are running 6 million or 6.5 uh, million, they're running almost half. And the estimates uh, could be that the Muslim population is not just six, but it's actually up to, to nine million. Uh, on October the 8th, 1990, an article was pu uh, published by the U.S. News and World Report stated that Islam is growing uh, at a rate of 400% per year in the United States. 400% per year in the United States. Uh, one source indicated that there were about 100,000 Muslims living in, in the United States in 1970 and that there are about 9 million Muslims living, uh, were living in the United States uh, in 2008, as you can see. Uh, and that it has grown exponentially since then. Another source indicated that, go ahead to the next slide, uh, that the average fertility rate uh, among non-Muslims, non um, United States, uh, Europe, uh, and thereabouts, is somewhere around 1.5 to 1.6. Uh, but the fertility rate of, among Muslims is 2.3. So what you can see is that simply by birth rate that they are going to outproduce uh, non-Muslims and simply through <laughs> through the birth rate that they would be able to take over. The oldest mosque in the United States is located in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, farm country. Back in, it was first built there in 1934. That's the actual mosque right there. Uh, can you imagine conservative Iowa, <laughs> farm country Iowa, 1934 conservatism, and that's where the first mosque was built. Today there are over 3,000 mosques uh, in the United States with new ones being built every week. There are currently, uh, depending upon what source you look at, there are around 196 countries in the world. 196 countries in the world. That's about how many bones you have in your body. You have about 205 bones in your body. That's the way I always remember that. Uh, so it's close to the same number of bones as you have in your body. So there's about 196 countries in the world. Of that, there are 65 of them that are devoted to Islamic rule. That's about 33% of all the countries in the, uh, that exist in the world are devoted to Islam. So it's not a small matter. Not a small matter. And Christians cannot afford to hide their head in the sand with regards to what's happening. We just can't. Islam came into existence some 1400 years ago, around the year 600 AD. It claims kinship with both Judaism and Christianity, 
But it also claims to have superseded both Judaism and Christianity as the only true way of salvation. Muhammad, the founder of Islam, is believed by Muslims to be uh, the, uh, the final prophet, uh, the, you know, the greatest prophet of God, but the final prophet of God. He was a, a native, uh, go ahead to the next slide, Nicholas. He was a native of Mecca, uh, which is, you can see the map up here in the left, upper left hand. That's where he was born and raised uh, in Mecca, a site that even before his birth, for hundreds of years, it was the city in uh, at least that part of Arabia, maybe all of Arabia, it was the place of the Kaaba. It was in existence for hundreds of years before Muhammad ever came on the scene. And it was the place where uh, polytheistic worship took place. They actually had around 300, uh, and I've seen this in different sources, so I think it's pretty reliable. They, they had about 360 uh, stone figurines representing various gods that were placed in the Kaaba. They had one central stone, however. It was a, it's a black stone. Apparently, it's still there in the Kaaba. Uh, and uh, according to many people, they think that it's a, a meteorite, but it became a stone that seemed to have some kind of power and force, uh, and people began to, to worship it. But that, uh, that meteorite or that black stone is still, to this day, in the Kaaba as one of the holiest uh, uh, articles or objects uh, uh, held by Muslims. At the age of 25, Muhammad married his uh, 40-year-old, wealthy, uh, widowed employer. Wealthy, widowed employer. She was in the trade business, and he had been in the trade business with, along with his uncle. Uh, but when they connected uh, with regards to trade, they really connected, and, uh, and she was rich. Uh, and his newfound wealth... Uh, allowed him the leisure to pursue his interest in religion. Each year, he would take an entire month off. It's kind of like me. <laughs> take an entire month off, and he would spend that month in a cave, meditating. Eventually, he became so disgusted with the polytheism of his day and all the the, the factions uh, even of Christianity and Judaism and polytheism and all that, he became so disgusted with it uh, that he uh, began, began, according to uh, the Quran, Muhammad would begin receiving these revelations from the angel Gabriel, and uh, he began uh, disseminating that information that he was the last and final prophet that would rid the land of polytheism and return everyone to the true, the one true monotheism. Uh, now, the people of Mecca didn't like uh, what he was preaching. In fact, they disliked it so much that when he began to say that he was uh, the ultimate prophet or the final prophet uh, of God, uh, they kicked him out of Mecca. So it didn't go over very well there. And he was there for years preaching, uh, but it didn't go over well. Uh, they kicked him out. He leaves and he goes to uh, the town north of there, about 200 miles north of Mecca called Medina. He went there and it's recorded in the books. Uh, that he went there on July the 16th, 622 A.D. And he went there with the intent of establishing a Muslim community. July the 16th, 622 also marks the date of the first day of the, uh, the Islamic calendar. That's their New Year's Day, July the 16th uh, of the year. Uh, so this marks the, the beginning of the Muslim calendar. At first, when, people, when, when Muhammad went to uh, Medina, uh, he was not welcomed there as well. Apparently, the people from Mecca and Medina, they, they had collaborated or talked. Uh, uh, but anyway, they did not like uh, Muhammad either. Uh, he was there, and he, he continued to receive revelations from Gabriel even there in Medina. And Muhammad would continue to, to share those revelations with the people there. Uh, they didn't like him. Uh, they wanted to kick him out of Medina as well. And as a result, he had enough followers that he put together an army. And with his army, he began to uh, conquer the surrounding tribes and he forced them to accept uh, his new religion called Islam at the 
point of a sword. From its inception, almost, uh, Islam has been an aggressive religion. Uh, this spirit of conquering and converting eventually led uh, to the idea of jihad. Everybody know what jihad means? Holy war. Which was the primary means by which Muhammad and his followers would spread Islam across Arabia. At the time of his death in 632 AD, all of Arabia was under uh, Islamic control, it's, which is incredible. All of Arabia was, that's within 10 years, within 10 years, it was all under his, uh, all under Muhammad's control and ruled by the teaching of Islam. In only 100 years, Islam had spread throughout North Africa, uh, the Middle East, eventually it went as far as Spain, Turkey, India, and even uh, to uh, uh, Western China. So that's kind of the, uh, some of the logistics with regards to how it began. Now, what's the practice? What is the practice of Islam based on? Well, Islam is primarily a religion based on human effort or works. The most important works or duties uh, uh, that are acknowledged by Muslims can be summed up in what they, uh, across the board, uh, Shiites and uh, Sunnis, uh, all of uh, Muslims would agree that it really boils down to what they call the five pillars of Islam. The first pillar uh, of which is uh, the duty of the creed. The duty of the creed. The first duty of every Muslim uh, is to bear witness, uh, which is done by sincerely reciting uh, their creed before at least two witnesses in order to become a Muslim. Uh, and then uh, after becoming a Muslim, through, through this, this statement, this creed, creedal statement, uh, then a faithful Muslim will continue to repeat that same creedal statement uh, over and over thereafter. The Muslim creed consists, here it is, here's the, here's the creed that they, they, ha they have to confess this creed and then they have to repeat this creed uh, in, the, in the years that follow. But here it is. There is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. And they would repeat, that's, that's the first duty of every Muslim, to re re repeat or recite the creed. The second duty is that of prayer. And we think, oh, isn't that a nice prayer? Well, all Muslims, they must submit to a very rigorous uh, prayer regiment on a daily basis. Five times a day, Muslims respond to the call of prayer. No matter where they may happen to be at that point in the day, the five points of the day, Muslims have to stop, they have to face uh, toward Mecca, place their forehead on the ground, and then they have to recite prescribed uh, prayers. Certain prayers. Prayers that were worded already for them. They do this at dawn. They do it at noon. They do it at midday. They do it again at dusk. And then they do it again two hours after sunset. Then every Friday they are required to meet in the mosque to pray and to hear an Islamic sermon. Muslims are required to pray at least five times a day, but each of those five times a day, they are required to pray certain, pray, uh, certain prayers or certain recitations within each of those five times. And it really it adds up to be about where they have to say about 17 ritualistic and repetitious prayers every day. Now, some of us have a problem with getting up and having a word of prayer in the morning or you know, having prayer on a regular basis throughout the day. But for Muslims, that's what they do. That's, that's part of who they are. And these prayers involve, according to, uh, to the teachings of Islam, these prayers involve confessions of sin, which begins with the purification of the body, you know, if, there's any, if they've done anything in the body, and then purification of the soul which would be purification of thought, life, and, and all of that. So that's, that's the, uh, the second pillar of Islam. The third pr pillar of Islam is the duty to give to charity. Now, there's some controversy on this because I've heard different uh, numbers. But Muslims, according to uh, most uh, su subscribers of Islam, are required to give 2.5% uh, of their income, of their total income, 
uh, to, the, to the poor and to the needy. I have heard other people who have translated the, the Quran who have said that that two is not a two, it's a 20, that they are to give about 20% of their total income to the poor and needy. So that's, that's the third pillar of Islam. The fourth pillar is the duty of pilgrimage. Every Muslim is expected to make at least one trip to Mecca, uh, to the Kaaba, uh, uh, during their lifetime. If they're, a, if they're physically and financially able to do so. If they're not able, uh, either physically or financially, then they are, to allow to, they are able to designate someone else to go in their proxy, uh, to go in their place. That's the fourth pillar. The fifth pillar is the duty to fast. During the Islamic month of Ramadan, which we are currently in, Muslims commemorate uh, the, the giving of the Quran uh, to uh, Muhammad by abstaining from food, all food, all liquids, and sex during daylight hours. However, they are allowed to partake in food and, and in drink and in sex after the sun goes down. So it's only during daylight hours. I don't think that's much of a sacrifice. But anyway, they're... Uh, that, that's part of what it means for them to fast. And they have to go through, they have to do this every day for the entire month of Ramadan during the daylight hours. In addition to these five pillars of Islam, there is a sixth one that is not um, officially recognized as a sixth one, but it is talked about as a sixth one. And that is the pillar called Jihad. And it's this pillar that we're Muslims really divide into two different camps, two different groups. Uh, they see jihad as uh, one group sees it this way and another group sees it that way. If you could kind of think of Christianity as uh, either uh, kind of Catholicism or Protestantism. Well, that's kind of how it is with, with regards to Islam. You have the Shiites and then you have the Sunnis. And the, the Shiites, they make up about 15% of the total population of Muslims. However, they are concentrated there in uh, you know, Syria and uh, Iraq and Pakistan and those areas. Uh, they're definitely concentrated there, but, they, but collectively, globally, they're only about 15% of the total population of Muslims. And, and what makes a Shiite a Shiite is because they believe that uh, Muhammad's cousin, uh, Ali, you remember Muhammad Ali? Well, this guy, his name is Ali, and he was Muhammad's actual physical cousin, that he was the rightful heir of the leadership of uh, Islam. And uh, so Shiites believe that Ali was the, the one who was the heir and the, the successor and the one who would communicate, uh, the, translate the, the Quran in, in terms of its teachings. Uh, and it was Ali that was really believed in jihad. He really believed uh, that uh, it, you know that the purpose of Islam was to uh, really dominate the entire world, and if need be, to, you, to do so at the uh, the point of a sword. The Sunnis, on the other hand, uh, they don't believe, uh, according to what research I'm coming across, they did they don't believe in the jihad in the same way as the Shiites do. They believe that the 79 verses in the Quran calling for violence or calling for jihad or for warfare, uh, that they are referring to defensive measures rather than offensive measures. Uh, they believe that jihad is really referring more to the intensity of discipleship as a, as a Muslim and the intensity of defending their faith, but not necessarily the taking up of swords and, and beheading and so forth. But that's the two different camps. Uh, but the, the, the Sunnis... Uh, believe that it, you know, that it was just it was defensive rather than offensive measures. However, that is not what a literal rendering of the Quran actually says. And we looked at some of these passages last week. I'm just going to just refer to them quickly again. But here's just a couple. I don't know how you translate this as defensive rather than offensive. Uh, but that's what the the Sunni Muslims do. O oh, you prophet, perform jihad against the infidels and the hypocrites. 
the infidels being non-Muslims, the hypocrites being Muslims who aren't really fully devoted, and be harsh with them. And their abode will be in hell, and evil is their destruction. That's from Quran chapter 9, and then from Quran chapter 47. So when you meet those who became infidels, so strike the necks until you have made a great slaughter among them. Now, I don't know how you interpret that as defensive. I mean, do you, can you see a way to translate that as defensive? I mean, to me, it looks pretty offensive to me. And that's only a two verses out of 79 that basically have the same language. Now, what is the, what is the Scriptures for Islamic people? Well, for Christians, we believe that both the Old and the New Testament, uh, that, that the, the Bible collectively, both Old and New Testament, that that is the authentic uh, authoritative book from God that we believe that it is literally the word of God uh, for Muslims though the only ath authoritative uncorrupted revelation from God is called the what? hello the Quran that's their Bible which is considered to be God's most uh, revealing uh, most recent and final work and it supersedes everything else uh, the word Quran, most people that I've come across are saying that it, that it literally means recitations. The word Quran means recitations. It means what? Recitations. Which is based on uh, the, uh, the belief that the angel Gabriel supposedly uh, gave these uh, revelations, which became recitations, but uh, Gabriel instructed Muhammad to recite the, the revelations that he received over and over and over again. In length, the Quran is about 80% the size of the New Testament, about four-fifths of the size of the New Testament. It contains 114 chapters. Each of the chapters are called Surah. So if you see it where it says, instead of saying the Quran chapter number and so forth, if you see where it says Surah, that's all that it is. It's still the Quran. It's just, instead of saying chapter, it's saying Surah. Surah means chapter. 86 of the chapters were revealed to Muhammad during his years in Mecca before he was thrown out. 86 out of the 114. 28 of the uh, uh, 114 chapters were revealed to him after he left Mecca and goes into Medina. Every chapter in the Quran is uh, divided into uh, verses. Uh, now here's the interesting thing about Muslims, and, and really honestly they put us to shame, maybe in some ways. Muslims uh, do not touch the sacred book without first going through a ceremonial washing uh, so that they can be purified. So they honor the book, uh, and they will not touch it without going through that, uh, that being washed. Uh, they never hold the Quran below their waist. They, it, one of the laws is they have to hold it above their waist. They will carry the Quran to war, write sentences from it on their banners. They will tie it, uh, scriptures or verses from um, the Quran. They will tie those uh, as, uh, uh, they will tie them around their neck as a part of a charm. Uh, they will, uh, according to uh, one place, said that they will always put it on the highest place, the highest shelf. In their house or in some place of honor in their homes. Uh, for Muslims, the Quran is considered the inspired Word of God. Now, another, go ahead to the next slide. Uh, another important book uh, for Muslims is called the Hadith, uh, which translated means tradition. It's a collection of the sayings and uh, uh, actions of Muhammad. These were not words that were given by Gabriel, but just simply things that that Muhammad would say or do. It would kind of, in, a, in some sense of the word, be kind of like the Apocrypha. Uh, these would be uh, kind of non-canonical books, but still very, very important uh, books that they would uh, look to for uh, guidance and inspiration and that kind of thing. Um, in addition to that, those two books, the Quran and the Hadith, uh, Muslims also believe in the Torah of Moses, the Pentateuch the first five books of the Old Testament. Uh, they believe also in the Psalms of David. Uh, they also believe in the Gospels of Jesus. 
They believe that, that these are also holy books. However, and it's a big however, they believe that all of them, the Torah, uh, the, the, uh, the Psalms, uh, uh, the Gospels of Christ, including all of the books of the Bible, they believe that they have all been corrupted by Christians and by Jews to the point that even though they consider them as holy books, they don't really see them as reliable. So let's take a look at what the Quran actually says about the Bible. Um, from the uh, chapter, uh, Quran chapter 2, verse 75, uh, and a party from among them indeed used to hear the word of Allah. He's referring to uh, uh, Jews and Christians in the writing of the, the Bible. A party from among them indeed used to hear the word from Allah, then altered it after they had understood it. And they know this. In other words, Jews and Christians intentionally corrupted the scriptures to corrupt the people. That's what the Quran says about the Bible. Now, how, how was the Quran written? And this is really, really interesting. How was the Quran written? Well, it's interesting that in the Quran, chapter 7, verse, one, verse 157, Muhammad actually refers to himself as someone who could neither read nor write. In other words, not one single word in the entire Quran was written by Muhammad. And he admits that right from the beginning of the book. He did not write uh, the Quran. According to Islamic tradition, different fragments of uh, the Quran were revealed by, uh, to Muhammad by, uh, by Gabriel that Gabriel would, uh, would word for word dictate uh, these revelations to Muhammad in this cave there in Mecca and then for some years, for, 23, for some time there in Medina. Uh, but for over the course of 23 years, after each occasion, after, after Gabriel would give this verbatim, word for word uh, uh, revelation, Muhammad was required to recite. That's why the term Quran means recitations. So Muhammad would receive the revelation, then he would have to recite that revelation over and over and over and over and over again until he got it firmly fixed in his mind. And then he would recite it to uh, the followers as they grew in number. Uh, Muhammad would, uh, would recite uh, the portions of the revelation that he had memorized. He would pass that on then to his followers. And then before he dies, some of these followers then begin to write down some of these recitations, uh, these uh, revelations. However, much of the Quran, or at least uh, some good percentage of it, was not written down by anyone, by, uh, uh, until almost 100 years after his death. Now let's think about that. He doesn't write anything down. His immediate followers didn't write some of these revelations down. But 100 years later, after he has died, uh, they are written down by his successor, whose name was Omar. Go ahead to the next slide, Nicholas. Now, of course, this is not the real Omar. There were no photographs back then. I just found somebody. I thought, eh, that looks like an Omar. <laughs> but a hundred years after Muhammad has died, Omar says, too many of those who actually heard Muhammad recite the verses, too many of them have died in battle. We better write the rest of these things down. That's how they got written down. At least much of it. But, uh, but Omar was more moderate. He's one of the, uh, the Sunnis. He was not one of the Shiites. He was kind of a moderate Muslim. Uh, and um, because of that, there was variations that began to form between those who had the more strict version of jihad and those who had the less strict version of jihad. And there began to be versions of the Quran floating around. And um, so, uh, so some years later, it was discovered that uh, you know, several Muslim communities, that they had their own version of the Quran. And fearing that, uh, that this was going to lead to uh, doctrinal confusion, the next success successor of Muhammad, the third successor of Muhammad, his name was Othman. He ordered that the Quran be edited. Can you imagine someone doing that with the Bible? Well, we need to edit the Bible. You know, there's some things that we don't... Well, of course, that actually probably does happen. But that's what happened with the Quran. 
which res resulted in a third version of the Quran. And this third version became the final version. But before the third version was put into publication, they collected all of the previous versions and they brought them together and they burned them so that there would be no way to compare the third version with the second or the first. So now we have a third version of the Quran. And it is the version that is used to this day. Um, but so, so we have three versions of the Quran. Muhammad didn't write anything down personally. Uh, some followers wrote some things down within his lifetime. And then somebody else wrote some things down uh, before all of the, uh, the first generation people died off. But so what if you have a question? What if you have, what if you say, well, I'm not really sure if this was part of the original um, revelation. What if you have a question about some of those verses that are in the Quran? Well, it appears that Muslims are discouraged from asking questions about their faith. And in fact, the Quran says so. So let's take a look from Quran chapter five. Oh, you who believe, ask not questions about things which have made plain to you may cause you trouble. Some people before you did ask such questions and on that account lost their faith. Muslims believe that asking questions about Islam could cause you to lose your faith. So don't ask any questions. <laughs> now there was an Islamic commentator, uh, apparently someone who was well respected in the, among the Muslim community, who was making commentary on the Quran who wrote this. The Holy Prophet himself forbade people to ask questions. So do not try to probe into such things. In other words, don't ask questions. Let me ask you this question. <laughs> Should Christians question their faith? Should Christians question the reliability, the historicity of the Word of God? Should they do that? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. The Bible is open to inspection. It is open to questions. We can look at the manuscript record. We can look at when it was written. Uh, we can look at outside canonical sources. We can do all of that. And it bears up under the scrutiny because it is the genuine Word of God and it is reliable. When you tell somebody, don't look into it, don't probe into it, what does that automatically suggest about it? That it's not reliable. Did you know that the golden tablets that uh, Joseph Smith supposedly had received from uh, his angelic visitation, that no one's allowed to look at that? No one's allowed to inspect that? <laughs> Folks, the reality is, is that you need to ask questions. You need to question me. You need to say, you know what, Mike's a man. He's human. He can make mistakes. You don't need to take what I say uh, for granted. You need to question it. You need to question things. I want you to look at what it says in Acts chapter 17 that concerning the people of Berea. The pe people of Berea were more noble than the people of Thessalonica. Why? Because they were willing to receive God's message and every day they carefully examined the Scriptures to see if what Paul said was true. They questioned Paul. They questioned the Scriptures. They wanted to look and make sure that this is reliable. Right now, Rhonda, my wife, is taking a course on the reliability of Scripture. And she has learned that, that there is a historical manuscript record that you can go back and it can be validated, it can be proved, but it can be inspected. And when you, you inspect it, it actually increases your faith, not decreases it. The Scripture is so reliable that you can ask any question you want to. I think you can ask God any question that you want to. He's open to that. The Scripture is open to being questioned. Christians ought to be open to being questioned. We're not going to hide our lamp under a bushel, as Jesus said not to. So, okay, now what do Muslims actually believe? Well, as Christians, uh, there are several, listen, there are several doctrines uh, that uh, it, it's pretty close between Muslims and Christians. Uh, there are several doctrines we share in common with Muslims. For instance, uh, Muslims and Christians both believe in uh, the resurrection, the forthcoming resurrection. Uh, they both believe in the final judgment of God. They both believe in heaven and in hell, although they refer to 
heaven as uh, the garden of felicity. I also believe that heaven's going to be like the garden uh, of Eden. Uh, but they believe in heaven and hell. They believe in angels, obviously, in Gabriel. Uh, they believe in Satan. So we hold those things in common with Muslims. However, that's about as far as you can go. <laughs> Most major doctrines are distinctive, uh, either to Islam or to Christianity, and we do not hold them in common. So what do Muslims believe about the Bible? Again, as Christians, we believe that the Bible is accurate without error because it was inspired by the Holy Spirit, not by man. Look at 1 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. For no scripture ever came from human initiative. When people spoke for God, it was the Holy Spirit that moved them uh, to speak and then ultimately to write. Um, Muslims, on the other hand, believe that the Bible is, has been totally corrupted. They do not believe... The, that the, the Gospels contain the actual words of Jesus. They believe that the, word, the, the Gospels are the words of people about Jesus, but they don't believe that they actually contain His words. They believe that Jesus' words have been corrupted. On the other hand, Muslims believe that the Quran is the Word of God. Now, it, this is important to kind of just uh, take a and pause for just a moment here. It's important to understand that if the Quran is the Word of God, Hypothetically speaking, if the Quran is the Word of God, then it should not contain any errors. Right? Because the Word of God should not contain any errors. So if the Quran is the Word of God, it should not, should not contain any errors, and it should be true for all, uh, on all issues at, at all times. However, that is not the case. If the Quran contradicts what the Bible says, Muslims are going to say, well, I, I'm going to land on the side of the Quran. But the, here's the dilemma, and this is really interesting. The Quran actually says, in Quran chapter 2, verse 136, it claims to believe in and continue and not contradict the Bible. The Quran says it's not going to contradict the Bible. But does it? Here we go. The Bible says God created everything in six days. The Quran says that God created everything in eight days. And then at another place in the Quran, it also says that it, it cre God created everything in six days. So it actually not only contradicts the Bible, but it also it con contradicts itself. The Bible says that all of Noah's sons uh, got into the ark. All three of them. But the Quran says that one was left behind. Now you understand why the movie Noah that we watched, that had the rock, the rock creatures in it. Now you know why one of the sons were left behind in the movie. It was based upon the Quran. The Bible says that Abraham's father was Terah. The Quran says that his name was Azar. That sounds like a contradiction. The Bible says that Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac. The Quran says that Abraham was going to sacrifice Ishmael. That's a contradiction. The Bible says that Abraham had eight sons. The Quran says that he had two sons. That's a contradiction. The Bible says that Jesus was born in a stable. The Quran says that Jesus was born under a palm tree. That's a contradiction. The Bible says that John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, was not able to speak for months. The Quran says that he was not able to speak for three nights. That's a contradiction. Another contradiction found in the Quran is the way that uh, Muhammad received his calling from God uh, or through, through Gabriel. Uh, in the Quran, there are actually four different stories about how Muhammad received his calling uh, 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 to receive these revelations. And each of the four are completely different from the others, from the other three. That sounds like a contradiction. What do Muslims believe about God? Well, if you learn nothing else, uh, understand, they believe that He is only one. They believe that the Lord is one. They believe that God is only one. Uh, and so they totally reject any notion of the Trinity, which means that they reject any notion that Jesus is God in the flesh. They do not believe that Jesus is divine. Muslim, Muslims believe that Allah could never have a son. He could never have a wife. 
And so he could never have a son. And so to refer to God as God our Father is blasphemy to the Muslim. Look at what it says in the Quran. Uh, in chapter 19, verses 88 through 92. And they say, uh, what's this word again, Margaret? The beneficent God has taken to himself a son. They, meaning the Christians, uh, certainly you have made an abominable assertion. The heavens may almost be rent and ferret. I'm not sure what, what that word means. Uh, and the earth cleave asunder and the mountains fall down in pieces that they ascribe son to the beneficent God. And this is not worthy of the beneficent God that he should take to himself a son. So they do not believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. They do not believe that he is God in the flesh. Muslims teach that anyone who believes in the Trinity is going to hell. So what then do they believe about Jesus? Well, one of the most mentioned names in all of the Quran is the name Jesus. It's mentioned 35 times in the Quran. If you were to talk to a Muslim about Jesus, they would say that they believe in Jesus. In fact, they would say in order to be a Muslim that you must believe in Jesus. But what kind of Jesus? What exactly do they believe about Jesus? Christians believe, the Bible teaches, that Jesus is God in the flesh. No less. But Muslims believe that he was only an apostle. Thomas, when the, after the resurrection, Jesus said, put your hands in my side and in, in the palms of my hands. And when Thomas did, what did he say? My Lord and my God. Did Jesus denounce that? No, because it was a tr statement of truth. Uh, but the Quran teaches that the Messiah, the son of Miriam or Mary, is only an apostle. The Bible says that Jesus is the son of God. Muslims believe that he is only the son of Mary. The Bible teaches that Jesus was crucified for our sins. That he died, literally died. Muslims believe that he did not die. Muslims believe that he ascended to heaven apart from death. Again, look at what the Bible says in comparison with the Quran from Luke chapter 23, verse 33. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified Jesus there and the two criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. And then from chapter 4, the Quran, chapter 4, verse 157 and 158. And they're saying, surely we have killed the Messiah. Isa, that is Jesus, son of Miriam, that is Mary, the apostle of Allah. And they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him. But it appeared to them so. And most surely, those who differ therein are only in a, in a doubt. Or, or in other words, they're confused about it. They have no knowledge respecting it, but only follow a conjecture. And they killed him not for sure. And they killed him, not for sure. Nay, Allah took him up to himself, and Allah is mighty wise. In other words, he ascended without dying. Without, apart from crucifixion. That's what Muslims believe. The Bible says that Jesus is the Savior of the world. But Muslims teach that Jesus was only a prophet. Again, let's compare the, uh, the Bible with the Quran. From John chapter 4, verse 14. Uh, God sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. From uh, the Quran, chapter 19, verse 30, He says, Surely I, that is Jesus, am a servant of Allah. He has given me the book and made me a prophet. That's all that they believed that He was, was just a teacher. Just a teacher. Just another teacher. And so what does that mean for Islam? That means that Islam does not have a Savior. Do you see that? They don't believe that Jesus was a Savior. They don't believe that He was God in the flesh. They don't believe that His blood purifies us from all sin. They don't believe that. So Islam does not have a Savior. It's a religion of works. It's a religion based upon rituals and not a relationship with God. And that is, in fact, folks, that really describes all religions. All religions are based upon man working his way to God. That's why I hate religion. Religion is man working his way to God. Christianity is God working his way to man, becoming man. From the Quran, chapter 4, verse 57. As for those who believe and do good deeds, we will make them enter gardens. Or in other words, we will make them enter heaven. 
Their salvation is based upon their good works. Our salvation is based upon God's completed work on the cross in Christ. For Muslims, uh, the most important of all works is uh, whereby Muslims will uh, garner the favor of Allah is by performing the, the five pillars of Islam. But the only way to guarantee salvation is by jihad. Is by dying while fighting for Allah. Islam is so works orientated that it actually teaches that your good works could cancel out your bad works. Look at the Quran from uh, chapter 11, verse 114. Surely good deeds take away evil deeds. This is a reminder to the mindful. But the Scripture teaches from Paul's writing, Ephesians chapter 2, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works. Muslim uh, Islam is based upon human work, human effort. And if, you, if the good will outweigh the bad, then you've you got a good chance of getting into heaven, especially if Allah is in a good mood the day that you die. But Christianity is not based upon God's mood. Christianity is based upon what God did on the cross. That He gives us His righteousness through His completed work so that we're not saved by our good works, so that no one can boast. Folks, the reality is, is that you know, I feel sorry for Muslims. I feel sorry for them. And I feel sorry for quote-unquote Christians who, don't, who think somehow that we're all in the same camp. Uh, I, I feel sorry for people who believe that somehow you know, that's how they worship God. They worship God this way and Christians worship God that way and all the roads are going to somehow lead to heaven. It's all going to be okay. I feel sorry for people like that because they are totally ignorant of the Scriptures. Are you hearing me? Do you, do you agree with that? We need to pray for the salvation of Muslims. They don't even believe they have a Savior. But I do believe that there is an emptiness in their lives. You can't be <laughs> thinking about having to always measure up, always the measure up, always the measure up uh, to what the Quran is teaching you. you gotta, don't miss any of your five scheduled prayer times today and make sure that you say all the recitations that you need to say today. Make sure that you give your 2.5% or 20%. Make sure you do. I mean, for people who are always under the gun, always burdened by having to always earn the favor of, of God, they have got to be on the inside hurting. No wonder they hurt other people. Because the reality is, is that hurting people tend to hurt others. And so they are hurting. And what they need more than anything else is what Jesus said. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, love your enemies. Do good to those who persecute you. And praise for those who mistreat you. And call you all kinds of things on my account. That's the answer. That's the answer. And so we need to pray for their salvation. Because if we don't, because of the fertility rate, because of the expansion through jihad and so forth, if we don't pray for their salvation, then we will lose this nation. We will lose this world, in fact. Uh, it's coming. We can see the numbers are there. They are not the enemy. The enemy is Satan. The enemy is ignorance. The enemy is darkness. And yes, I do believe that America has responsibility to take military action to, to safeguard non-Muslims against threat. Absolutely. But at the same time, we have got to somehow pray for, uh, for Muslims. We've got to pray for them. We've got to pray for our enemies. We've got to do that. If we don't, then we're going to be no better than they. Than they. So let's pray. Lord God in heaven, the church in America has so, for so long now, we've been like the ostrich who's, who's hit our head in the sand. And uh, the, 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 those who are uh, an enemy of the faith, and those who are uh, contrary to faith in Christ, they are rising up all around us. But not only Muslims, but all those, secular humanists, atheists, Hindus, Buddhists, uh, 
people who are agnostic, who have no faith or whatever, they're all around us. And somehow we go about our merry way and we think that everything's going to be okay. You've called us to be the salt and light. You've called us uh, to see your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. You've called us to pray for that. You've called us to share our faith with other people around us and to pray for those who are lost. You've not called us to say, I'm okay, you're okay. You've called us to say that you're the only path that leads to life and that those who are on that path are going to be saved and that those who are not on that path will not be saved. And we are called, you've called us each one to stand in the gap and to testify, to bear witness, to tell others about you. We pray for uh, the Muslims uh, in Aiken. We pray for Muslims in South Carolina, in the United States, and we pray for Muslims around the world. And we pray, God, that you would use this month of Ramadan as a way of helping them to truly seek out the Scriptures and seek out your heart and seek for the truth. And that, that those who are Christians who are all along the path of Muslims, that that they would point towards you, and that they would not be afraid, even if it costs their life. Help them to stand firm, as Rhonda said earlier, help us all to stand firm. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. It's all stuff.